All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So, welcome to another edition of In the News. Before we begin, I just have to say happy birthday to Tony Braxton. I didn't know Tony Braxton was 51 today. That's crazy. Time just flies, man. It's like all of my favorite artists are just getting up there, which is a good thing. As long as they're living and healthy, all is well. I've always enjoyed Tony's voice. She's probably one of my favorite altos. I just enjoy the tone and the richness of her voice. On, on top of the fact that she has some really great songs. So, you know, like people like Tony, um, Anita Baker, Gladys Knight, Layla Hathaway, Brandy. Like those are my favorite altos. I really enjoy the voices that they have and what they can bring to music. They're just excellent. And so anyway, I was getting ready for um, my little outings this morning. And I had my little playlist on. And one of them Tony songs came on. It was, um, what was it? It was Why Should I Care? Off the Secrets album. You remember that one? Like the... Every time I start to sleep, I just remind Like that is such a great song. That one, and then it had uh, Shanti Moore and Babyface on the background vocals. Great song. So, and then right after that, Joe's I Wanna Know came on. When I tell you I was having a whole benefit concert up in here, my neighbors probably hate my guts. But anyway, moving on. So Melania Trump, I have to start off with a good laugh because when I tell you I cackled down when I saw this. Um, I don't know if you've seen this clip. You know, she's currently on the continent of Africa doing... I don't know what she's actually doing, but she's in Africa traveling around. And so she was at, I guess it was like an elephant refuge and the little elephant just was not checking for her that day. And so um, here's, here's the clip. You know what that's about? That baby elephant must recognize that Melania has two stepsons that like to go out and trophy hunt and shoot other elephants and lions and giraffes and rhinos and everything else that's out there. Hell, to be honest, they probably shot that elephant's parents back in the day. So that elephant already knew what was up. That elephant said, nope, not, not today. And Melania had to take a step back because that elephant said, we're not doing a photo op today. Absolutely not. I always have a problem with people that go and trophy hunt. Like, especially if you leave where you live and you fly to another continent to go kill some other animals. Like, that's some jacked up stuff anyway. Them animals were minding their business, dude, living their best life away from humans. Here y'all come shooting up everything just for the fun of it. Just to have a picture on Facebook or Instagram or whatever else you put your pictures on. That's jacked up. Okay? And then they always have these crazy weapons where it's not even a fair fight anyway. The animal didn't stand a chance. That's why I like that clip of that reindeer that fights back at the dude that was hunting him. I don't know if you've seen that. And like the dude drops a shotgun and everything and that deer was just bucking like... Quack, 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 quack. I was like, oh, okay. I didn't even know deer could do that. Like, listen, that deer was pissed off. Okay, you got messing up his, uh, what was it, the Christmas Eve shift, okay, he had some toys to deliver, you done shot at him, now he gotta slow down, you done messed up everything, the other reindeer's waiting, hell, now he got to go around the world in half the amount of time and deliver twice as many toys, that deer was pissed off. Anyway, then another thing, I saw Milani was pissed because she was saying she's tired of everybody criticizing what she wears and they need to focus on what it is that she does, and I wasn't trying to be rude, but y'all can answer this for me, can y'all please just... Let me know what it is that she does. I know she has the bullying campaign. I don't really know what's going on with it, but I know she has that. But if y'all just, can y'all let me know what it is she does? I'm honestly asking that question. I'm not trying to be shady. I just want to know what she does. And as far as the, the attire, if we look at the pictures that, that are there, you, you, you're dressed up like the colonizers that came in 1884 and snatched up everything anyway. The minute I saw her with that hat on, the first person I thought of was Leopold. Now listen, they don't ever teach y'all about Leopold in school, but Leopold is the one who went to the Congo. He was from... Belgium went and killed 20 million people in the Congo talking about he was passing Christianity around and killed everybody instead getting ins the enslaved thing and you know if you ever see like the chocolate hands in um, like Belgium some parts of like northern Europe you know those chocolate hands are symbolic of when they were you know chopping off the hands of the enslaved people in the Congo so I was like people you know you gotta kind of use a little bit of common sense and be you know understand what, what might be culturally insensitive to the people in which you're visiting you know um, but yeah, y'all please answer that question. I just want to know what it is she does. I, I really do. We don't even see her. I didn't even know she was still around, to be honest. No disrespect. Actually, no, I, yes, disrespect, because she was one of them birthers asking for that birth certificate, too, so I do got a problem with her. Anyway, moving on. Um, and then I don't know if you guys have seen this story with the, the artist Banksy from the UK. So Banksy is this artist that has all these great portraits and paintings and everything like that, and one of his paintings auctioned for $1.4 million. And so the people, they have purchased the painting, and can I just fast forward to what happens next? So if you didn't catch what just happened, the picture started shredding on its own. He actually created some cool little gadget within the, the frame of the picture where the picture would self-destruct if it was ever auctioned. Can you picture if you spent 
1.4 million dollars on something and right after you buy it it falls apart that's like buying a car and getting a car accident the same day you know like <laughs> that takes me back to i remember when i was um when i was a teenager one of my good friends growing up they called me hi yo i got my license we about to be in this I'm like yeah all right, me. All right. two hours later <laughs> they didn't call me yo man long story short they done backed into somebody's car tried to drive off the person got their license plate they had to go back <laughs> <laughs> like when I tell you they were grounded forever, you just grounded the rest of sophomore year, just grounded forever. That crap is funny, but yeah, I'd be kind of pissed if I if I bought that painting. I, I want to know if the people who um purchased it had to keep the picture or you know still have to pay the money. Like that that sucks. I'd be real pissed off. You know th stuff like that. You know I, to be honest, if those people have to still pay that money and keep the raggedy picture, to be honest, that artist might be on the next episode of Dateline if we're being honest. Cause you know, if folks can kill folks over a ten thousand dollar life insurance policy on forensic files, I know one point four million dollars is worth getting shot over. If it's the right person, I'm not trying to put emphasis on killing folks or nothing. But I'm just saying, people are crazy in 2018. You never know what you're gonna get. Anyway, then we jump over to Chicago, and as you can see, Jason Van Dyke was actually convicted of second degree murder for the killing of Laquan McDonald, which. I honestly, I didn't expect that to happen. I was totally shocked. We'll see what happens with the sentencing. But you know, in that same breath, then you have Timothy Lohman who shot and killed Tamir Rice and he just got a new job as a police officer in the same state, just in another department. I'm like, how does that work? So they find you not capable of doing your duties within the police department that you're in. So they let you go and another police department picks you up. I'm like, how does that work? So you, you shoot and kill a 12 year old kid um, in two seconds and clearly you, you're not you're not able to process things logically and you're not really quick on your feet to make logical decisions but they still hire you to go and do the same job i don't know something's questionable about that but you know so it just goes to show you how things kind of counterbalance unfortunately but we'll see what happens i want to see what happens with the other officers as well as far as the laquan mcdonald situation because it was a ton of officers that were shooting it was just da -da 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 -da. it was like a scene out of set it off if you've ever seen that video i'm not going to post it because i told y'all i don't like posting too many traumatic things um, especially when it deals to the plight of the black experience in America. I don't need to see, I don't need y'all to see people that look like us getting shot and killed just because. Absolutely not. Anyway, um, there's a great documentary that was out. It came on HBO. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Student Athlete. It's actually really, really good. And it's funny because we, we were just talking about um, how some of the student athletes are treated like a few videos ago. But this documentary is actually really, really good. It follows four or five athletes. It follows um, a high school student that's on their way to college it follows um somebody who's out of college and trying actually the other ones are actually all out of college one person has um some some long-term injuries that prevent them from playing basketball ever again and it actually prevents them from just doing daily basic things there's another person who something happened with the ncaa um and the football and everything like that and so they weren't allowed to play and long story short now they're out of college and they're trying to get on the nfl um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really good. Another person is unemployed. Another person is working like five or six part-time job. It, it, it's really, it's interesting. It, Cause the, the numbers and the statistics that they pull out, I'm like, man, cause you know, there's like 90,000, 91,000 NCAA athletes and you know, 300 of them go to either the NFL or the NBA after college. I'm like, wow. So, you know, it's a, it's a really, really narrow line to make it. So again, like I said in that other video, if that's the dream that you have, go for it. Just make sure you are the best of the best of the best. And I would definitely say, make sure you have things in addition lined up with what you want to do. I always say don't have a plan B because plan B means you've already given up on plan A, but you should have plan A, plan A part two, plan A part three, plan A part four, section C, like have all of your plans. Like I always say, don't have a fallback plan, just have your in addition to what I wanna do plan. You know what I mean? Um, so check that out if you get a chance. Very, very good. I wish there was like a part two because I wanna see what happened with the athletes and everything. They do kind of give a rundown of what happens with them when the documentary is finished, but I want to see where they're at in like another year. Um, very entertaining. Um, also very insightful. Um, and then Janelle Monae, I see that she is going to be starring in the live action um, version of Lady and the Tramp, which, God, I barely remember how that movie goes. It's one of those Disney movies. It definitely came out way before I was born. I had it on cassette. Remember back in the day, like if you grew up in like the 90s, when people used to record everything, like you had, you'd get the two VCRs and do a double tape and record stuff. And my parents at the time, when I lived in Italy, because there was no cable and stuff like that, my family and everybody else, they would like double tape different movies and then mail them to us in, in Italy. And then that's how we'd watch things. Because I remember one of my tapes, it had Lady and the Tramp, it had Hunchback of Notre Dame, and it had 
whatever the fourth installment of Aladdin was, I remember it was all on the same tape, but I can't remember how Lady and the Tramp goes. I know it's two dogs. I remember the scene you always see in the commercial with the two dogs and the, the little noodle and they end up kissing, but I can't remember how the movie goes. But anyway, good for her. Um, if I had a favorite Disney movie, actually, I don't think this movie's Disney. Toy Story's Pixar. I don't know if that's Disney. Is it? Well, either way, Toy Story would definitely be one of my favorites. I mean, I could also say Lion King, but that's cliche. But no, Toy Story was one of my favorites because I remember as a child, I used to really think that the toys were alive as well too. So I remember I would leave my room and then try to run back in the room real quick and see if the toys were moving. Like, right, don't, don't judge. It's okay to have an imagination when you're a child. Um, and then listen, I don't really follow UFC fighting, but I did get a glimpse of a few snippets of the what was it McGregor and Habib fight. All I'm gonna say is I'm glad to be one because I don't like McGregor. McGregor get on my nerves. He seems very racist to me. Just he says a lot of things that are out of pocket. He's all you know, like I was I was watching the press conference clips. Actually, let me just let me I'll post it. Ooh, slap him then. Do something about it. What are you gonna do about that? Is that the disrespect in here? Do something then, I just shut your mouth. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Assalamu alaikum alaikum The Chechens know, the Chechen people know that if the tables were turned and there was an opportunity for his father to stab that man in the back, he would do it in a heartbeat. And be respect always. This is what my father teach me. And I never give up and I always yeah, the, respect. The, the father but wasn't I don't know the about picture. his father. Just I don't want to stop. About his like, father, because I, I, I cannot. Bump into you, pal. Because you know, I hope I don't bump into and, you, sir. Uh, it's all these picture. men are known for. They were chased about. from their land. They were chased from their land to the edge of cliffs. My family, my bloodline, the McGregor clan, we stood and we fought. We fought the English Empire. So you see what I'm talking about? Like he's calling him the dude's dad a terrorist and stuff like that. I have a problem with that. And then I remember when you know the Floyd Mayweather fight and everything was going on. He was calling the people monkeys and stuff. I, I got an issue with him. And he's cocky. I don't know what. He's already talking trash too now. He said he's ready for round two. I'm just glad he lost. That's exactly what it gets. So his his energy just sucks to me. And then I see Drake over there with the little Irish flag running behind everybody. Drake loves to ride any bandwagon of success. I'm like, sometimes I need you to be down with people when they're on the way up. It's cool to support them when they've already made it, but damn, you know, Drake shows up to any and everything. He, like, the best time, you remember that time during March Madness? And I can't remember the two teams. He was supporting one team, they ended up losing. An hour later in the locker room, he got on the other team's jersey celebrating, popping. I'm like, what? No! <laughs> you can't do that. It doesn't work like that. <sighs> anyway. It's kind of like when people used to always make fun of me because I was a Seahawks fan. Because um, remember, like Seahawks sucked until about 2013, 2014. They had a good run in like 2005, and they had a good run in 99. But the years before and in between and in between, they've just always kind of been, yeah. So people used to always try to clown. And I was like, okay. Then they started winning. But, you know, we're currently on a hiatus, though, because I'm not really supporting the NFL right now. So Plus, from what I heard, they ain't doing that good anyway. So that's that. And then I saw that Iggy Azalea had to actually cancel her tour, or at least the American leg. Um, I'm not really sure the logistics of why, but you know, usually if a tour gets canceled, it's because either the sponsors have all pulled out, or they can't book the venues, or people aren't really buying the tickets. Um, but here, here's my musically inclined opinion on why I think Iggy's been having a hard time, as opposed to my personal opinion that I really want to give. Um, I'll say this. I think Iggy's having a hard time because she doesn't really have a solidified base as far as fans. You know, I always say, and I've said this in my R&B is Dead video, when you belong to a certain genre of music and you cross over to pop or you cross over and you get that mainstream hit the good thing about having a bass in that specific genre of music is that when the mainstream success dies out you can always go back or you can always rely on that specific genre to back you up a perfect example i'll use tony braxton since we talked about her like tony braxton um at one point was this really huge international superstar like her Sophomore album sold more than the debut album. Mind you, the debut album sold 8 million copies. And the sophomore was like, okay, well, we're going to do 20. What's up? So, you know, and, and if you look back, like, in 97, she had the second biggest hit of the year with Unbreak My Heart. Um, and, and mind you, the song came out in 96. It was still booking then. So, you know, but as, you know, the times changed and she kind of went on the decline, she was still able to pull hits in the R&B realm. She wasn't really doing as much on the Hot 100. But in the urban AC world, in the R&B world, as far as touring and everything like that, she was still in command. So she could still rack up a bunch of R&B hits. She could still go on moderately successful tours, you know, that are catered to her R&B fan base. And then good thing is she still has a lot of notoriety with pop audiences, even if they're not really checking for her. So, you know, and it's the same thing with a lot of, a lot of other R&B acts as well. So somebody like Maxwell has that same experience where he gets the best of both worlds. Sade is a perfect example. The group Sade just, you know, they're not really gonna get a lot on the Hot 100.
But when they come out with a project, it's huge because they, they still have their core fan base that have been with them since the 80s. And then, of course, mainstream audiences, if they feel like checking for them, they, they'll check for them. But Sade will be okay whether or not the mainstream audience is there or not. Janet is in that same boat. You know, if you talk about Janet's decline after the Super Bowl incident, she still had a bunch of hits in the R&B world. She still went on tours and everything like that because she had that base to fall back on. The issue with Iggy Azalea is Iggy Azalea came in as a rapper. And she wasn't respected by the hip-hop community or by the majority of other rappers. And so her success has always been driven by what the pop audiences were into. And because Fancy was such a huge hit at that time, she didn't need the hip-hop audiences because she had the mainstream success. And so what happened is she had this great wave for about all of 2013 and a piece of 2014. And then the wave went into a different direction. And so now it was her trying to figure out where she belongs as an artist. But she never won over the hip-hop audiences. Um, and, and the pop artists, like I said, pop music is fickle. Pop goes wherever the wave blows. So you could be hot on the Tuesday and you could be crap on Thursday. Ask Tyrell Cruz, you know, or, or Jason Derulo. No disrespect to them, but I'm just saying. You can have the biggest hit on a Monday and by Tuesday you're, you're nothing. I think, to be honest, I think the hardest genre to be successful in if you want to solely just be in that genre is pop music. Because pop music already doesn't really have a distinct sound. It's something that changes and shifts whenever. But you just say that whatever is the popular trend is considered pop music. And if we want to really go there, I think the handful of artists that have really been consistent in pop music and still somewhat, they still somewhat can pull the hits. Madonna, Britney, um, I'll say Lady Gaga is, is still holding on. Justin Timberlake, depending on, well, right now he ain't really doing that great, but he's on tour. Um, you know, pop music, it, it, it's that. But pop audiences decided that Iggy Azalea was no longer it. And so they moved on to the next person. They're all partying with Cardi B now. And so, and, and the thing with somebody like Cardi B is Cardi B has the respect of probably half the hip-hop audience and then the pop audience. So Cardi and all the other rappers who are doing whatever else they're doing, people like Nicki and stuff like that, they came and they took what's rightfully theirs. Same with like Nicki. Nicki already had a hip-hop core, you know, fan base, but she also had the audience of the pop world. So even in those moments when Nicki kind of falls off and the pop world isn't checking for her, she still has hip-hop heads that rock with her. So she's always going to be okay. Iggy has to find that base. I don't think she has a base. And I think that's why she's not really... She's, ha she's come out with a lot of singles and lots of videos and everything like that. And I, sometimes I'll see her stuff on Twitter or Instagram. I'm like, okay, she's, she's trying. Uh, but, you know, she's not catching on. And then another thing is, just because you get a mainstream hit doesn't mean you're always going to be popular. Sometimes people just want you for five minutes and they don't want you anymore. There's some acts that, that rack up giant hits and then you never see them again. You're like, what happened? Where, where, where did they go? Or they had that one album that was just a hit and then everything else afterwards you were like, we're good on. We're good. Don't worry about it. And, and that could be Iggy. You know, there's no guarantee to longevity in the music industry, especially as a pop artist. Like I said, longevity as a pop artist. And, and when I say longevity, I'm talking about longevity as keeping that mainstream success and still bringing in the numbers and bringing in the sales and selling out the arenas and the stadiums and stuff like that. It's extremely hard. Um... I, I think honestly, the only genre of music where people can consistently keep that same impact really might be rock music, even though rock is kind of falling off really hard. But you know, when I look at who's doing the stadium tours in 2018, aside from Beyonce and Jay Z, um, they may be the only. Oh, yeah, Beyonce and Jay Z are like pretty much like the only R&B hip hop act on the stadium tour at the moment that I know about. I might be wrong. Maybe there's somebody I don't remember. But when I look at like the pole star, it's always these big giant rock bands from the 80s. You know, there's the Metallica and the Black Sabbath and the ACDC and Bon Jovi and, you know, all of those groups. They, they stayed doing these big giant stadium tours forever and ever and ever because their base is solidified. You know, they had the rock was super, super huge in the 80s. The big hair metal bands and everything like that. Super, super huge. Their fans are loyal. They will support them no matter what, even if they're not even getting anything on the charts anymore. Um, and so I think Iggy, I don't know what to tell her because I, I don't see where she fits in right now in 2018, to be honest. Um, but, you know, it, it hit, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I really don't. But, you know, that's that. But, I mean, she's not the only person who cancels the tour. Things happen to a lot of artists. And sometimes you can make a comeback. Um, sometimes people go into decline and then they, they reemerge. So maybe she might reemerge. She's not really my type of artist. Um, but... She, I, I do see with some of the fans that I see commenting, the ones that really go hard for her, she does make a connection with those fans that really like her. So maybe she might make a combo. But Iggy, I'm, I'm, I'm good on. She's not really... Yeah, I'm not checking for her, but no disrespect. Um, anything else? Oh, and then last few things. If it's already out in your city, please go and support um, The Hate You Give. That's the movie with Regina Hall and... God, what is that girl's name? It's Amanda Steinberg? I think that's her name. Really great movie from what I heard. I'm going to go see it tonight, actually. Um, and I just read that the actual screenwriter for the movie died, unfortunately. I don't know what that's about. So yeah, definitely check that out if you get a chance. 
And then, of course, Haiti. Um, God, that's crazy. I was just talking about Barbados, and now Haiti got something going. You know, Haiti had an earthquake. Uh, fortunately, it was not as terrible as the one in 2010, but there were still people who died. So, Haiti, you know, you are in my thoughts and prayers. And I hate to say thoughts and prayers line now because all these politicians have just taken, taken the, the validity and the genuine out of that phrase because they always say the crap and don't mean it but you know Haiti I always said has a special place in my heart I remember when they had the earthquake in 2010 I remember I went and I volunteered at the Haitian embassy like I, I post a picture I think I, I'm gonna post a picture if I can find one or two and I remember that was 2010 it was like January 2010 I went and I volunteered at the Haitian embassy because you know all the embassies are in DC anyway I remember I skipped class I went and volunteered and they had me in this department that pretty much you were trying to get people who were on the U.S. mainland, connected with people back home to make sure you know everybody was all right. But it was terrible because, of course, the phone lines are down. Like when that that earthquake came in 2010, it just came and cleaned house. So I mean, even the capital was it was just done. So it was extremely hard helping people get in contact with their families and stuff like that. I mean, it was a really, really the environment. Fortunately, was very warm. Like the people that worked there were really nice. I mean, they were trying to make sure you were fed and everything. And I'm like, I'm good. I'm trying to help y'all out. Y'all don't gotta feed me. But I mean, they kind of made the environment. A little bit warmer because the work that we were doing was so it was very daunting very it can be it was very emotionally draining um and, and i would definitely say that's probably one of my first moments when i realized i was probably going to end up doing work in the community i mean I, at that point i had already volunteered at a boys and girls club in dc for like two years but something with that just I, I, it just felt right you know what i mean um wow so anyway that's all i have um Actually, I'll share that with you guys later. Anyway, I'm out. Subscribe.